she went, and, and that's the last we saw of her. It's totally out of character. What are we looking for? The worst part about this is we don't know what happened. There are no answers, and, and we need to have answers. Somebody's life is gone from the picture. In the summer. MSNBC, the whole picture. Over the last 20 years, the dangers of hitchhiking have been well documented. But in the early 1970s, an era that encouraged freedom and exploration, hitchhiking seemed like a relatively safe and adventurous way to travel. But, as two teenagers from Brooklyn, New York discovered, such adventures can turn deadly. In July 1973, the country's attention was turning toward a scandal called Watergate. But 800,000 music fans were focused only on the Watkins Glen New York Outdoor Concert, starring the Grateful Dead, the Allman Brothers, and the band. For two of these fans, 15-year-old Bonnie Bickwit and her 16-year-old boyfriend Mitchell Weiser, the trip to the concert would become a decades-long mystery. Bonnie and Mitchell first met at John Dewey High School in Brooklyn, New York, and had a close circle of friends. Well, they had met in high school and became very close very quickly. And basically, Mitchell's friends and Bonnie's friends, we all became one group. In that summer of 1973, while Bonnie was working at a summer camp in the Catskills, Mitchell had a summer job at a photography studio back home in Brooklyn. He and his friend Larry bought tickets for the Watkins Glen concert. Ordinarily, my mother was very permissive, but she just had a really bad feeling about this, and it just stuck with her that she just was not going to let me go. Larry canceled, so Mitchell decided to meet Bonnie at Camp Wellmet and take her to the concert instead. They planned to meet other friends at Watkins Glen, but Mitchell's family worried about this new plan. When my mother heard about the change of plans, she just didn't want him to go, and there was a lot of pleading from her for him not to go. She said, let me get you some more money, and he, he ran out of the house. Mitchell left Brooklyn on July 26 with just $25 in his pocket. He got on a bus to Narrowsburg, New York, the town closest to the camp. Meanwhile, Bonnie was trying to get time off to go to the concert with Mitchell. Her parents were vacationing on Cape Cod and had no idea their daughter was planning to leave. She was, in fact, very unhappy at her job. Ultimately, I think she felt like she was being exploited, that she was working 16 hours a day. And he wouldn't give her the night off. And she quit and said, I'm leaving. Mitchell arrived at the camp around midnight. He spoke to his sister on the telephone and told her he had taken a cab from town and had already spent his $25. We were worried. We didn't know what happened. And I said, look, if you don't have the money to go to the concert, don't go. And he didn't want to hear it. The next morning, with no money and no transportation, the couple had to find a way to travel to the concert. She made a big sign saying to Watkins Glen, and they were planning to hitchhike there. On the camp roads, there'd be trucks and vans coming in and out of camp. You could get a ride into town relatively easily with somebody. She borrowed a sleeping bag from a friend, said, I'll be back on Monday. We expected him back on, I think, Sunday night. And we just, you know, we were just waiting for him to come home, and he, and he wasn't showing up. When Bonnie's parents returned home a few days later, they quickly learned something was terribly wrong. It was Tuesday, and my husband was home, and he received the call asking if Bonnie was home. And he said, no, she's not home. Isn't she at camp? And that's when we uh, found out. Bonnie and Mitchell never made it to the concert. Neither of them has ever been seen again. Bonnie's parents immediately traveled to the summer camp where they reported the disappearance to local authorities. But in an era with the slogan, turn on, tune in, drop out, the police assumed their disappearance was only temporary. The newspapers, everybody 
they were looked at as runaways. It was the times, you know, I mean, it was the, people were running away. People were escaping. They were doing their own thing. They were going on communes. They were living differently. That's how the police viewed it. The Bickwits received a letter Bonnie had written just three days before leaving for the concert. It only strengthened the theory that the couple had run off. Dear Mom and Dad, I love you both very much. Up here, I have my independence. If on my time off, I feel as though I want to get up and leave, and it is physically possible for me to do so, I do it. I don't have to tell anyone if I don't want to. I really want for you to allow me to and not mind my traveling and doing things. After reading the letter, I felt, well, she'll be gone for the summer and come back, certainly, the end of the summer and back to school again. But as the weeks and months passed and there was no word from Bonnie or Mitchell, both families began to fear the worst. Police felt the pair may have run away, but their families felt differently. Neither Mitchell or Bonnie seemed the type that would leave family and friends without a word. It was totally out of character for her to leave without the intention of coming back. If her kid is going to fall apart, there would be lots of ways that it would happen. And you would, they wouldn't be honor students. They wouldn't be so close with family. Something would start to sh happen. And this was not the case, except a letter home and, and an unhappy job that she was going to run away with her boyfriend and not come back. Bonnie and Mitchell were both intelligent, outgoing, and responsible young people. Mitchell was very, very bright, and so was Bonnie, and um, very outspoken and very articulate, and um, certainly were the type of students that were very popular. Desperate for answers and receiving little help from police, the families contacted the FBI and members of Congress for help to no avail. They began to search for Bonnie and Mitchell themselves, exploring even the most remote possibilities. I had seen different psychics, and some felt that they were in California. And then I had this friend uh, who joined a Hare Krishna group in California. <clears throat> and I wrote to her and asked her if she could look into it further. And I got in touch with different underground papers. Wherever there was a lead, I try to follow. Next, the trail goes cold until a reporter picks up the scent when Missing Persons returns on MSNBC.